Good afternoon. Welcome to our monthly briefing. Happy to have you all joining us. Uh, we also have our Deputy Mayor Sharon Owens, as usual, joining us. Uh, before I get started, I want to recognize that it is National Wear Red Day, uh, which is part of the Go Red for Women movement, uh, raising awareness of the fact that cardio cardiovascular disease is the number one health risk for women. So that's why I'm wearing my red tie, my red pin. You'll see the Deputy Mayor is in red, and, uh, and City Hall will be red this evening. So I want to recognize that important cause. Just going over the agenda briefly, uh, we're, as we always do, we'll do an update on COVID-19, uh, look at the data, talk about vaccine administration, also specifically talk about the Super Bowl coming up. Uh, we'll go over our CompStat data <clears throat> and talk about police reform. Deputy Mayor will, will touch on that. We'll look back at our storm response to the Nor'easter. We will talk about deer management. I want to give everyone a last reminder on the Bloomberg Mayor's uh, Global Challenge. I'm going to give everyone an update on my outreach to uh, newly appointed Secretary, uh, Transportation Secretary Buttigieg. Talk about bike share, uh, winter parks programming, and then we'll open it up for questions. So uh, full agenda here. So on, uh, on the numbers for COVID, uh, looking, uh, looking at the chart, uh, which you'll see momentarily, um, good, um, we're headed in the right direction. So 507 active cases right now uh, in the city of Syracuse, that's uh, less than half of what they were just during uh, at last month's briefing. So uh, good progress. As always, uh, we don't wanna let our guard down, uh, but those are definitely headed in the right direction. Looking at the state's early warning monitoring dashboard, uh, all of the metrics are headed in the right direction. You look at that positive test rate, uh, case rate of 2.9% under 3%, that's significant. The, the chart you see in front of you here is severity of infections. So hospitalizations was a key metric that we talked about as we were, as the numbers were going up in the late fall, uh, early winter, December, January, uh, those numbers are headed down and uh, again are down about half uh, from where they were a month ago. Um, that's good news for a lot of reasons, not the least of which uh, is that our healthcare workers have been uh, working nonstop and uh, they have truly been heroes and, and glad to see hopefully them getting a little bit of relief as well. So I mentioned the vaccine. Um, we are seeing the vaccine roll out, certainly not as, as fast as we would like given some of the supply constraints. Um, so there have been some challenges along the way, uh, but in addition to the county and the state regular operations at the On Center and the State Fair, I'm very pleased that we've been able to work with the county and the state uh, to get out into the community, uh, to meet people where they are. Uh, just over the past two weeks, we were at AME Zion Church down on South Salina Street. I visited there. And then this week, I was over at uh, Toomey Abbott Tower uh, for a vaccination clinic, as well as Dr. Week. So we've been on the on the south side, uh, kind of in the central part of the city and, and, and up on the, the north side. And um, those operations have been running very smoothly, and we've been getting at some of our harder uh, to reach populations. Um, so uh, thankful to the county executive and, uh, and Governor Cuomo's team for their partnership in doing that. We need to continue to do that, uh, and, and we will. Uh, we're looking at getting over to the, to the west side uh, soon, and we will continue to make our way around the city. Uh, at, uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to the Deputy Mayor, who has been uh, very involved on our vaccination efforts and, and specifically around issues of equity. So, Deputy Mayor, you're up. Thank you, Mayor. I wanted to take a moment to start with um, those graphs that the Mayor just uh, shared with you and that tremendous spike in January. Uh, was very personal to me. Um, uh, myself and my family started this new year battling COVID. Um, and that surge really tells us we're a, a, a very COVID conscious family. Um, we, we social distance, we wear our masks, uh, we don't go into crowds when we don't need to. Um, but those numbers touched our family in, in a big way. Every single person in our home um, 
was affected by COVID in, in, in different ways. It started, uh, and by the way, I talked to my uh, family because I was thinking about sharing this with you all and, and they, they, they agreed that I, I should do it. And so I want to do that today. And, uh, you know, started with, you know, my, 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 my husband and my, and my daughter who didn't do anything but just go out back and forth to work or just the normal things that we do. But those numbers that you just saw from the mayor just tells us um, just how prevalent the virus was out there in our community that, at that time. We had no um, holiday gatherings. We went to no holiday gatherings. But uh, our new year started with, with their exposure and um, I continued, uh, of course, had to go into quarantine and worked and, 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 and cared for them. And it, and we have a home that we can um, figure out how we wanted to divide it. We had a, another bathroom. Many, many homes don't have that, don't have that flexibility. And it really began to hit me full circle. You know, I've heard the stories, but I'm experiencing it. And um, to see that virus, it swept through every single one of us. Um, the two young people in our in our house were able to pretty much bounce back, but it was the two older people in our house, my husband and I. I ended up in the hospital for five days. Um, and one last thing I'll say that really um, brings that thing really full circle, really to my face was while I'm in the hospital, um, I was in Kraus. Um, they were absolutely amazing. Um, the, the the just the staff there from the nurses to the doctors to the dietary staff that make sure when you had an appetite you you got a, a well-rounded meal um and i also um had a had a had a stark um, moment when uh maybe three days in i was taken i was never on a ventilator but i was taken off oxygen and they wanted to see if i could maintain my my oxygen levels on my own and after the third baby, we did that. And I was able to do that. The reaction of the, the the medical staff, every time they came in my room to see that I was breathing on my own, that I was maintaining my oxygen levels, it was a celebration. And that hit me hard. That told me that there were many other rooms they went into, that that was not the case. And there were people struggling to survive during this virus. So again, Continue to get tested if you have symptoms. You may not have symptoms. We we the, the county has been amazing in their ability to get us tested if we want to test. Get a test. And as we move into this phase of vaccines, this is why being a co-chair with um, Dr. Amy Tucker, who is the uh, chief medical officer at uh, Upstate Hospital, and Latoya Jones, who is um, the um, Syracuse Health and uh, Central New York Health Advocate for 1199. We are all co-chairs of the vaccine, the Central New York, the Vaccine Equity Task Force. That's why this is even more important as we go into this next phase um, of making sure um, this is a, a, a public health, but it is also a personal decision. And there are many people who are afraid or apprehensive. We have many people in our community who still don't get a flu shot for a lot of apprehensive reasons. So our job for that task force is to ensure that they have accurate information to make an informed decision about the, the uh, getting the vaccine. And when they're ready, we wanna make sure that there is nothing stopping them from getting that vaccine, no barriers. And so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll move on in talking about uh, the, the vaccines and what's going on now. And, and while that's coming up, I'll finish with we're on the, the, the other side of this recovery hill. I'm so thankful, I'm grateful to all the friends and families and well-wishers out there. Um, um, I just know that um, just being that vulnerable was hard for me because I'm a control freak. So, you know, for, for others in the community who, who, who need support, just people coming by and shoveling off my sidewalk so the mailman could get in or or bringing by um, packages and leaving me at the door. Just thank you to everyone and for everyone. Let's all take care of each other. So there have been 53,000 um, doses administered in Onondaga County and 1.8 million statewide. And, this, and, and Governor, Governor Cuomo um, made equity a major issue when distri distributing this vaccine. And so the state's charge has been to bring the vaccine to minority 
and underserved communities and not the other way around. Not to expect them to find us, but we need to find them and we need to make that accessibility um, as easy as possible. And so vaccine, the mayor mentioned pop-up vaccination clinics in the city this week included Tumi Abbott Towers, which is operated by Syracuse Housing Authority, Dr. Weeks Elementary School, um, where more than a thousand doses were uh, delivered. Uh, so that is amazing. And we're getting more and more organizations volunteering their spaces for us to continue to use their sites. So as usual, our community in a crisis and, and when there's a need, they come, uh, they come running and that's going on right now. And so we, we want to invite you all to New York State as they have for everything in COVID has a, has a, a website and a, a link where you can track um, uh, vaccine doses um, throughout the state. Um, upstate is the regional hub for the five county area and they're working lockstep with the county um, and the uh, task force uh, committee, which is comprised of almost 12 sub committees around very specific areas that we need to focus on to ensure that there's equity with distribution of the vaccine. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Deputy Mayor, and thanks for sharing your story. Uh, it was a uh, it was a scary time for all of us. I'll, I'll never forget um, talking to you, um, trying to talk to you uh, when you were in the thick of it, and uh, you said a lot of prayers. And, and uh, really glad to have you uh, back on your feet. So thanks again for sharing. It's it's important to, as you said, it's one thing to look at the numbers. It's another thing to really personalize it and humanize it. And, and you certainly did that for me, and and hopefully uh, many others in the community. Uh, on that note, uh, we are up against uh, uh, another challenge here in our community, uh, really across the country with the Super Bowl coming up on, on Sunday. And I just want to remind everyone, again, we, we've seen the numbers uh, going in the right direction because I think uh, what, that spike uh, scared a lot of people straight. And, uh, and, and as I said earlier, we cannot let our guard down now. And Super Bowl Sunday is a, is a great tradition in this country. It's a great opportunity to, to get together with friends and family, but not this year. You just can't do it. Um, and so don't. Stay in your house, watch it with members of your household, and look forward to getting together and having a party next year. Uh, but, but now is not the time. Uh, it is not the time to spike the ball. The game is not over. The clock hasn't stopped running. We are still uh, in the red zone here. So please stay diligent. Also a reminder, state restrictions are still in place. There's been a lot of focus on the fact that the, the cluster zones, the yellow zone, orange zone have, have been removed, but there are still state restrictions in place. Uh, the non-essential public outdoor public gathering limit is at 50 people. Um, not essential indoor gathering is at 50% of the uh, occupancy with a maximum of 50. And uh, non essential residential gatherings um, are maxed out at 10. So those rules are still in place. Uh, we expect that they'll uh, be followed. And uh, again, it's in everyone's best interest. So please be safe and enjoy the game. Switching over to our CompStat report, our weekly CompStat report, um, the numbers in front of you, I want to just make. Um, manage everyone's expectations. Uh, it is very early in the year. So the earlier in the year, uh, the less uh, dependable those uh, those numbers are. I mean, certainly we like to see all those negative uh, percentages, but uh, but again, it's uh, it's early. So just as a reminder, at the, at the closeout of 2020, we ended the year down uh, overall 7% in crime, which is uh, where we hit about mid-year 2020 and, and really uh, stayed there for, uh, for the majority of, of the year. Um, so again, this is just the first three and a half uh, weeks um, that you're seeing here in uh, in January. Um, you do see that the two homicides uh, reflected um, for for the year. Of course, uh, we're all very familiar with uh, with the tragedy uh, that took place with uh, Mrs. Fold. Uh, we also lost a young 20, 21 year old man, Todd Christ, and uh, every one of those. Uh, Homicides are, are human beings with families and uh, and, and should be grieved and, and mourned. Uh, so we certainly uh, grieve and mourn for those two neighbors that we've lost. Um, not much more to report uh, other than, you know, especially early on in the year, it's always good to look at those five year numbers to get a little bit more context. Uh, but again, we'll hopefully continue to see negative percentages as we move throughout the year. 
I mentioned the police reform and re reinvention plan. Um, so just to remind everybody, in addition to all of the work that we've been doing here in the city of Syracuse on police reform, much of it stemming from the executive order I issued back in, in June of 2020, uh, Governor Cuomo also issued an executive order that required uh, all municipalities in the state with a uh, with a law enforcement agency to uh, to compose a plan that is due by April 1st. And so uh, we have been working on that on a parallel track with our own efforts, uh, and we've been doing that in partnership uh, with Onondaga County and other municipalities throughout the county. Again, the deputy mayor uh, has has carried uh, the lion's share of the load here, but we've we've worked with a lot of others, uh, including councilors. Council President Helen Hudson has been very involved, and uh, we look at this as an opportunity again to continue the progress that we've made. So we, uh, again, in compliance with the governor's executive order, submitted a draft plan to the Common Council last week. It was released publicly, 76 pages. It's a lot to get through. Um, and uh, it goes covers a lot that we've accomplished uh, and identifies a lot more that we still need to do, including 27 new specific actions. So I'm gonna turn it back over to the deputy mayor just to talk a little bit more uh, about this plan. Just get yourself off, off mute there, Deputy Mayor. Getting you back in the swing of things here. Oh my goodness, how long do we have to do remote before we get the mute thing together? Um, so yes, it is a, a, a large document. It is a draft. I have to emphasize that again. It is a draft. We are required and obligated to present to the community a draft for their input. Um, and it is um, a draft that must must again and, and and should go through our legislative body, which is our common council, uh, to ratify and, and approve. Um, I have been uh, meeting uh, and speaking with the chair of the Public Safety Committee, Council Majoke, and it was presented uh, on January 27th to that uh, Public Safety Committee meeting and is now on the agenda um, for us to um, begin that public uh, comment process. Um, city representatives and stakeholders participated, as the mayor mentioned, in the Onondaga County um, comprehensive uh, effort. Um, as written in the plan, our community is um, um, very close knit. You all know that from Center City, it only takes a, a few miles and you're in a whole new municipality. So the 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 idea of having a comprehensive plan countywide is similar to many other communities um, in New York State who have done done the approach it this way. And so we have as well. And I think it bodes well to us as a collective community around this topic. The final plan. Um, is required to the state by April 1st. We 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 are on we are on track for that. And the city draft was again submitted last week to the Common Council. They will be holding a public hearing on February 18th at five o'clock to give the community an opportunity to speak to them about the plan. I encourage everyone to uh um go to our city website where the link to any common council meeting is held there and also um, to visit uh, the the link that's on the bottom where you can actually download the plan and actually also input uh, insert your comments at that place um, i just want to end with um, it's never a good time to get sick but I got sick just before we need to make this deadline to submit this plan to the Common Council. So I just had, I cannot just um, stop without just thanking the team members um, of, of city government um, from our comms team to our law department, to the police department, to our API, our research and development department, just everyone touched this thing to get it across the finish line to present. Um, I'm back in the game. Um, I'm glad to be here, but I could, we, I, we wouldn't have made it without just that concerted team effort. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Again, it, it's been a team effort and, and not certainly limited to City of Syracuse. I mentioned some of our other municipal partners, but again, also the community. The, we would not be where we are uh, on the topic of police reform without uh, constant engagement and, and constant uh, pushing from the community. So I want to I want to recognize that and, uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, so moving on, just a quick look back at our at our nor'easter. Um, you know, all things considered, not uh, you know, 
not uh, certainly not on our our top ten list uh, of storms, but it was a it was a challenging one, and I'm really proud of how our city workers handled the storm. From certainly from DPW, our plow drivers, uh, but also uh, our parks team stepped up. SPD was out writing a lot of tickets, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, but I, I think uh, I think um, our city team did a did a great job clearing snow. Um, you know, one one thing that I'm learning in uh, in this job is that. It's really hard to to measure uh, snow removal performance because every storm is different and unique, and so it's hard to hone in on that data that, that really tells you how you did. So you, you know you do have to rely somewhat on anecdotal information, how many complaints you get on on, on Facebook or on City Line. Uh, for the record, we didn't we didn't get many, um, but this one was unique because it just kept snowing. So it sn snowed for about 34, 35 hours straight. And when it continues to snow, it's hard for the uh, the plows to get off the main routes, the rush routes and onto the side streets in the neighborhoods. But uh, every time it slowed up a little bit, they were uh, shooting off onto the side streets. So I think uh, you know the vast majority of the side streets were were covered in a timely manner too. And, and those that, uh, that we hadn't quite uh, gotten to yesterday, we uh, by yesterday, we, we certainly got to yesterday. So uh, really, really proud of, uh, uh, of the effort of the team. As I mentioned, SPD had to write a lot of tickets. Um, Police Department wrote 225 parking tickets and had to tow 11 vehicles because too many people uh, are not following odd even parking rules. And that's um, always a, a public safety issue and, uh, um, and an inconvenience. Um, but it's a it's a significant public safety issue uh, during a snowstorm when we get we can't get plows down the streets uh, the streets don't get plowed cars can't get out emergency service vehicles can't get in and out it's a real problem so uh, people need to, uh, to need to step up and and make sure you're following the rules so we can get these roads cleared and, and keep everybody safe. Um, Again, we towed 11 vehicles and we'll tow again. We don't want to. Uh, towing is an inconvenience on us. It still delays the plows and it's a significant inconvenience and burden on, on the individuals whose cars we're towing. So we don't want to do it. And again, uh, we encourage people to follow the rules wherever possible. Get your car off the off the street. Um, and uh, again, it's uh, we're, we're continuing. We debrief after every storm. Look at what we did well. Look at where we need improvements. We'll continue to do that. Uh, but I, I think... Uh, uh, you know, we've hit a good stride here on our snow removal, uh, and uh, it certainly helps that we've got those 10 new plows out there, including Lizard Beater here. And it's been a lot of fun hearing uh, from friends and family and constituents talking about, hey, I saw Control Salt Delete or I saw Blizzard Beater uh, as, as they're going through the neighborhood. So it's it, it's been fun. Uh, another uh, another public health challenge that we've been uh, that we've been meeting is on the issue of deer management. It's uh, it's amazing for as much as I uh, heard about deer management on the campaign trail in the first couple of years. It's been a little little quieter this year. Maybe it's because we we did have a, a successful season last year. Uh, maybe it's because we've got a lot of other things to worry about. But you know, this is an issue uh, that is a public health issue. Certainly, it's a nuisance. Uh, it's annoying when your flowers get eaten and uh, and, and your garden gets ruined. Um, but uh, beyond that, we know that uh, we have an overpopulation of deer in the city of Syracuse. Uh, leads to uh, deer motor vehicle accidents. Uh, has an impact on the ecosystem, uh, on our parks and, and uh, green spaces, and it presents a serious health risk uh, in that you know uh, that we know that uh, ticks. Uh, are often on the deer and, and make their way onto us and, and are a significant uh, contributor to Lyme disease. So it's a real issue. And it was an issue that for decades, the city wasn't able to do anything about. But last year, we brought everyone together, including our partners at, uh, at the county uh, who supported us financially. And we had a successful program last year. This year, we were uh, we were held back a little bit because of COVID, but the county stepped up again with funding. And uh, in beginning next week on uh, February 8th, uh, we will be back out uh, on a, a number of sites throughout the city. Um, so we're going to be undertaking our deer management efforts um, uh, over the course of February and March. Um, as a reminder, these are sites that are on either on private property or are on public property that's closed off. Uh, it's done between uh, dusk and dawn. Um, we do not disclose the specific sites because of public safety 
concerns. Um, generally, if sites are identified, it tends to draw more people and activity to those areas, and we don't want to do that. We were able to do it safely last year. We want to continue that this year. We work very closely with the police department to make sure we're doing that. If you have any questions or concerns, you know, this is not a, a fun topic to talk about, but it's an important one. Um, you can go on um, the Our City page, which is ourcity.seargov.net, uh, where there's a Q&A on the program. And um, uh, related to that, uh, we will also be um, conducting uh, public education sessions with the Parks Department on tick-borne illnesses and personal protection. So uh, keep your eye out for those as well. I have mentioned previously and wanted to give one last reminder to the community that uh, we have asked the community to help us come up with big ideas for the Bloomberg uh, Global Mayor's Challenge. Uh, again, the idea here is to come up with a, a big idea that can improve the quality of life uh, for citizens here in Syracuse, but also could be re replicable in other in, in other areas. Uh, Bloomberg offers a $1 million prize. We've developed a great working relationship with Bloomberg Philanthropies. They funded our innovation team as part of our API office and a lot of other endeavors. And uh, we're excited about this opportunity. So last week we opened up um, we, uh, an online form and have been accepting ideas from the community. So thank you to those that have contributed ideas. I think we're close to 80 ideas now. Um, we've got a few hours left until the close of business today where you can still submit your idea. The, the uh, website again is ourcity.seargov.net and uh, there's a form on there that you can click on, fill out your idea. And in case uh, you uh, think that you know, nothing will ever come of it. Um, the picture that you see here in front of you is a reminder of how uh, how we can, uh, how these ideas can lead to amazing transformational projects. So back in 2013, the city of Syracuse was a finalist in this challenge. And the concept at the time was called a public uh, a world market square. And World Market Square has become the Salt City Market that is now open and wildly successful. Uh, so um, shout out to all those involved in uh, in doing that work back in 2013. Again, it was not a winner, um, but it certainly is now, thanks to the Allen Foundation and a lot of other partners. And uh, it's a great opportunity, again, to, to think big for our community. So please do. Speaking of thinking big, uh, we've continued to think big about the opportunity that we have with Interstate 81 and the removal of the viaduct and replacement with the community grid option. Um, I want to congratulate uh, now officially uh, our new Secretary of Transportation, uh, former Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Um, as you may know, I wrote to uh, then nominee uh, Secretary Buttigieg uh, about a month ago or so and uh, about the 81 opportunity. And with the help of Senator Schumer and Senator Gillibrand, that letter made its way through to his team. And we heard back from them uh, just, just last week. Um, we have a meeting scheduled next week on February 10th with Secretary Buttigieg's team. We're going to talk about 81. We're going to talk about the community grid, the transformational opportunity that we have to improve transportation, uh, to improve the lives of those living within the shadow of the viaduct, uh, to create jobs and uh, speed up our recovery from the pandemic. Um, and uh, we couldn't be more excited about it. So uh, it, uh, encouraging sign that uh, that we, we appear to have traction and, and Secretary Buttigieg is hearing a lot about Syracuse these days, uh, which again is a, is a good thing. So uh, more to come, we'll report back. And we're also gonna use the opportunity not just to talk about 81, but to talk about some of the other related opportunities, including uh, the, uh, the idea of bringing a bus rapid transit system to the city, which has been a priority of mine and of this administration. And we think with the 81 opportunity and with the new administration, uh, there's an opportunity to accelerate uh, the implementation of the BRT system as well. So again, stay tuned. On the topic of transportation, uh, we know that uh, in order to be a, an inclusive, welcoming city, we need to have multiple modes of transportation. And uh, we, we talked about 81 and the importance of uh, our infrastructure and, and transportation around uh, vehicles. We talked about BRT uh, for public transportation, uh, but our bike share program that we launched uh, uh, just a, a couple years ago now, uh, the Syracuse Sync program, is another way to get around the city, whether it's for recreational purposes or, uh, or to get to and from a job. And uh, it was very successful. 
Um, we had strong ridership, uh, but unfortunately, like a lot of things, COVID had a significant impact on the operation and ultimately the, uh, the operator of the, of the program uh, put the program on pause. Um, the, the bike share in, uh, in micro mobility market is changing rapidly. And so uh, with that pause, we saw it as an opportunity to reevaluate our micro mobility needs and to engage with potential new partners. Uh, so we actually just released a request for proposals this week um, for shared micro mobility systems, which again would include a new bike share program as well as other potential systems, think scooters, other ways to get around. Um, uh, but you know we are going to be looking for a new operator of the Syracuse Sync uh, system. Um, so the RFP went out on Tuesday. Responses are due back March 11th. Our goal is to get our bike share program back up and running uh, this spring, and, and hopefully with it will come some other uh, new mobility options. So um, continuing to keep our eye on the ball and make sure that um, that the city is accessible to everyone, regardless of their mode of transportation. Last thing I want to touch on is uh, parks. Um, so our, our uh, parks winter programming is really heating up. Our parks department has been significantly impacted by the pandemic, but uh, our team led by Commissioner Julie Lefebvre has been very creative uh, about making sure that we're getting people uh, out and active and engaged. And so we've got some some great programming coming up. Uh, already underway is our, uh, is our uh, mobile uh, pop-up snowshoe rental program, which has been making its way around the city. Um, so you can you can register on our uh, Parks and Rec um, uh, website, which is syracuse.recdesk.com. Um, every Monday we update uh, we update it with the locations. Tomorrow we're going to be at Burnett Park. Uh, we'll set up in the parking lot across from the pool at 10 a.m. and then again at 11:45 a.m. Registration is is currently open on on the website. So uh, check it out. It's a lot of fun. We have snow finally, so let's uh, let's embrace it. Um, I encourage you to get out there and, and enjoy. Um, we also have some great indoor activities, basketball. Uh, so we have a free basketball skills challenge at the Magnarelli Center gym uh, for young people ages seven to 18. Um, and participants can test ball handling skills as well as free, free throw skills. It will be done in a safe manner uh, uh, using uh, social distancing and uh, and there will be uh, a chance to win prizes, a, a championship on February 27th. So again, uh, you can get on the parks website uh, beginning on Saturday, tomorrow, February 6th at noon to sign up for our skills challenge up at the Magnolia Center. And finally, swimming. I know it's hard to it's hard to think about swimming in February, uh, but we are in the process of getting our Valley Pool open back up. Uh, we're gonna do 18 scheduled lap swim sessions per week. Uh, there'll be hour-long sessions offered on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, we will have uh, early a.m. time, so you can get up and get that swim in before work or school, uh, as well as in the afternoon and the early evening. So uh, we're working on getting the pool filled back up and ready to go, and we'll have more information to share on that shortly. So with that, uh, before I open it up to questions, I do, do also want to acknowledge that it is Black History Month. Uh, we are celebrating Black History Month all month. If you keep an eye on our social media uh, channels, we are celebrating um, uh, uh, people uh, both locally and, uh, and, and nationally prominent uh, individuals um, that uh, really uh, help us uh, acknowledge and, and, uh, and celebrate Black History Month. So uh, with that, uh, I'm here, Deputy Mayor's here, and uh, media's here, so happy to answer some questions. Mayor Heights, Chris Baker. Um, there's a there's a COVID relief bill around Congress right now. Do you have an idea of how much Syracuse would stand to benefit from from what the current proposed package, the 1.9 trillion dollar package, looks like? We haven't seen the numbers yet, Chris. So we're trying to work with our federal partners to to uh, to get a better handle on that. Uh, it's certainly needed. Um, it's it's welcome. I'm trying to maintain my cautious optimism, although as we've talked about before, uh, I've been let down in the past, so I'm just kind of sitting back and, and letting it play out, but encouraged by the Biden administration, uh, by uh, Majority Leader Schumer pushing that forward, and uh, as soon as we get the details of what that means for the for the city of Syracuse, we'll, we'll share that, but again, it's, uh, it's very much needed and welcome. 
Hi, Mayor. Uh, this is Olivia Dance with Channel 3 and 5. Um, I have a question relating to Destiny USA. Um, the new rules for minors are now in effect at Destiny USA. Um, I'm just curious how you feel about the new policy. Do you think it will be helpful or do you think there's more that needs to be done? Well, it, I have mixed feelings about it, Olivia. Uh, I mean, it's unfortunate that those rules had to go into place. Uh, I want to be clear, you know, Destiny USA, as big as it is, is a is a privately owned establishment. It's a private space, and, and therefore they make the rules about who goes in and out. Um, and uh, we try to uh, to support them however we can. Um, they're an important partner, and the Syracuse Police Department specifically works very closely. Um, but oftentimes the, the, the problems that we have out in the community make their way into the mall. And uh, we have seen specifically um, challenges with young people. Uh, unfortunately, I think that there are some parents out there that, that use the mall as a, as a babysitter, um, and that's not the appropriate use for it. Um, our, our, you know, our children need to be supervised, and that's, that's the, the point of the, uh, of the, of the rule. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I remember going there in high school and, uh, you know, I, I saw a note come in today from a, a, an upset parent who has a 17 and a half year old uh, and, and who's very responsible and, and she's very upset that she's not able to, uh, to go to the mall. And I, I get that. I'm sure I'm going to hear the same thing from my girls when they're a little bit older. So, um, you know, again, it's, uh, it's the mall's decision. Clearly, some things had to change because there were ongoing problems. I, I was hearing about them regularly from the police department. Uh, we're trying to be a good partner, and um, you know, hopefully, they they can uh, they can get a better handle on it, and 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 maybe those those rules aren't uh, aren't aren't going to be always needed. But uh, it appears that they are now. Thank you. And then I, I actually have one more question going along sure. with Destiny USA, just in, in regards to the death of Bob Conjol. Um, I just wanted to, to give you the opportunity to say anything um, about that. Yeah, so it's appropriate that uh, that I was talking earlier about the, the uh, global mayor's challenge and thinking big. That's what Bob Conjol did. He thought big. He was a he was a visionary. And while the mall gets a lot of attention, um, some of my favorite buildings and spaces in the city uh, were uh, are, are there uh, because of because of him. Um, Franklin Square that was uh, largely uh, Mr. Conjol and, and his partners that revitalized that uh, that old industrial part of town, uh, the Clinton Exchange building, and so you know he he was a lightning rod, uh, uh, especially on the mall project. Uh, um, but there's no uh, uh, there's no taking away from uh, from his vision, uh, from his work ethic. He was a notoriously hard worker up uh, way before anybody. And uh, and he was one of the most significant business leaders we've ever seen in this community. So uh, I've, I've been in touch with his family and, and certainly thinking about them right now. Mayor of Selen Abbott, my dog is barking. I hope you can hear me. I can. Um, with with uh, the the uh, with the new secretary Buttigieg, what are you going to talk about? Why is it important you're going to get together with him? And I know that um, Congressman Katko has invited him to come to Syracuse. So how important is it that you get with him? And what are you going to talk about at this point? So at this point, uh, Ellen, there's there's a lot to talk about. And again, I appreciate uh, Congressman Katko's outreach as well as uh, Senator Schumer and Gillibrand. And I think our, our entire federal delegation understands the opportunity we have here. Uh, and, um, you know, we're at a critical juncture with, with the 81 project. The draft environmental impact statement that was released by the state is now in the hands of the Federal Highway Administration. And, um, and so uh, we need to make sure that at the highest level, uh, that uh, that the federal government understands uh, what's at stake here with 81, um, and and I specifically want to make sure that they understand that uh, that the city of Syracuse and, and as mayor that I am uh, uh, very much supportive of the community grid as the preferred alternative. Um, I I will uh, reiterate as I've done with others that you know for those that have concerns about that I think that there's an opportunity through this process to address some of those concerns. But again, this is a transformational opportunity. We have to get it right. And that doesn't mean just getting the design right. It means getting the project right. Um, we see this as a once in a generation opportunity to get people to work, to get city residents to work, people that have not benefited uh, from these types of opportunities historically. Uh, and in the federal government uh, through their uh, rules and regulations can be a, a, a significant partner 
in, in, in uh, allowing for the flexibility to ensure that we maximize the, the, the number of local people, um, uh, as well as uh, disadvantaged businesses, minority uh, women-owned businesses. Um, we want everyone to benefit from this project, both on the workforce side, uh, but again, also on the community side. We know that those that were living uh, along the route of the viaduct uh, were disproportionately negatively impacted, were uprooted, displaced uh, when that when that uh, highway was built. We have many people still living within the shadow of that viaduct. Uh, we, need, we need to make sure that we center them in this process and give them an opportunity uh, to benefit from this process. So uh, there's no shortage of things to talk about and uh, really look forward to having the conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Mayor, uh, now that we, we have a confirmed case of the UK uh, COVID variant in Onondaga County, uh, I just wanted to ask if you have any concerns about college students possibly bringing in these new COVID strains. Well, I, I, I certainly wouldn't single out college students. I think it was inevitable that it was going to make its way here. It's here now. Uh, the good news is it sounds like the, the vaccine is effective with it, but it, it does sound like it is more uh, it, it spreads uh, easier and, and faster. So it's certainly concerning, but we're going to continue to follow the science and the data and continue to keep our, our, our efforts focused on um, practicing those safety measures that, that keep people safe, uh, regardless of the variant, uh, but, but increasingly importantly, getting people vaccinated uh, because we know that, uh, that, that that's the, the most uh, significant and effective way that, that people can be protected. So uh, concern, but, uh, but again, not, not taking our eye, eye off the ball here. Uh, we need to continue to move forward and, and uh, get people vaccinated. Thank you. What else? Um, and just for Sharon, this is Ellen Abbott again, regarding um, reaching out to the communities uh, of color that seem to be unrepresented. Yesterday, um, the county executive said only 7% of the people getting uh, vaccines, as far as he knew, were African American, and there was lower uh, in, of others too. So, what do you do? I mean, is it is it just going out and talking to these people? Is are the pop up vaccination clinics enough, or do you have a plan going forward with that? It, it, Ellen, it is beef stew. It, it starts with um, historic dis, distrust of healthcare systems by people of color, um, and particularly African Americans, because of the history in this country around health um, um, services. So um, it is, first of all, making sure that people have the accurate information to make an informed decision. And then it is ensuring that there are places that um, we don't want people to have to always go find uh, the health care. The health care has to come to them. And in addition to that, we've had conversations around even the fact that um, much of the um, Reg registration has been online. There's conversation now about how we can create opportunities where service providers can do a bulk of that. Um, think of our homeless community, for example, um, online registration is not going to work. And so we have probably, as I mentioned before, about a dozen subcommittees that are working on this from our healthcare providers to our on the ground um, um, community health um, advocates to our homeless advocates, to our disability um, community. So we really split it up to give bite-sized um, topic areas for people focused in on those areas to really look at. Um, we were asking them, tell us what some of the hindrances are, tell us what we need to do to alleviate them and keep us abreast of how it's working for those populations as we move forward. This is um, going to be an absolutely moving target and we have to be flexible in all of our approaches. Other questions? Going once, twice, okay, must be Friday. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, have a, a wonderful and safe weekend. Take care.